a professor of psychoanalytic social psychology and social psychiatry at the International Psychoanalytic University, IPU Berlin, and an associative, associate member at the Center for Transdisciplinary Gender Studies at Humboldt University, Berlin, uh, the Institute of Sociology and the Cornelia Goethe, Goethe Center for Women's Studies and the Study of Gender Relations at Goethe University, Frankfurt. So, yeah, so this is, uh, this is Phil. He's a very good friend and a colleague from, from the ITU. And today we're going to talk about some of his work on empathy and some of his ideas of empathy. And I think, Phil, I, I, correct me if, if I'm mistaken, you're going to take some, some of the ideas that were presented here by Brett and Lizzie uh, even further, make them even more radical. Um, so yes. let's, uh, yeah. let's, not, uh, let's not oversell it, you mean. Let's not promise them too much. We'll see. We'll see. So, so we're, we're, I, I would like to, to start uh, by talking a little bit about empathy in interpretive and qualitative research, uh, which is, uh, well, a type of research that you have uh, a lot of experience uh, in doing. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about this research, about the, your particular interest uh, in that has been materialized in these forms of research, and particularly about empathy. How, how does it manifest? Let's, let's begin by, uh, how is it commonly manifesting in, in this discourse, in this scientific discourse? And then we'll try and see what critique you have to, to give us. All right. Um, may, may I start with a couple of preliminary um, remarks, um, yeah. please? Uh, the first is, it's, it's really kind of confusing. I see myself like three times now. So <laughs> help with me if I get confused, but it's um, like over here on the big screen that I see on your screen that and to small ones um, and with kind of a time lab with a reaction. So interesting, <laughs> um, interesting experience to have. And, um, that was the first one. The second one, um, of course, is I'd really love to be with you. Um, the couch really looks fantastic. And I, um, I have one over there and it was like thinking about like moving all my stuff over there to the other couch in the other room. However, um, the last one is kind of a, thanks really for, for having me here. Um, I mean, my, my, mind is kind of exploding from the talks from um, from before, so many new thoughts. Um, so it'll be kind of a little bit challenging to move from listening to, to talking. And however, my, my thanks are a little bit ambivalent, um, I must admit, um, because, you know, I, I'm, 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 I know, I mean, in my social psychology classes, I'm, I'm used to um, do all the kind of criticism on, on um, empathy that, you know, Breithaupt and like Bloom and et cetera, and talking about the dark sides, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I've got kind of good empirical material from a project as well. But um, in, my, in my qualitative research classes for the like last 18 years, um, I still have like highlighted like the value of, of, of empathy so much all the time. So, and um, this opportunity to kind of, um, think with you um, about like the, the ambivalences um, really, I mean, um, I really need to critically um, revise and review my, my work and like dozens of, of, of presentations. Um, so um, thank you for, for the extra work um, to do now. Um, however, so I'm, I'm not gonna um, present some kind of um, prepared, kind of perfectly prepared arguments, but um, it's still kind of an ongoing process of, of, re of thinking and rethinking and reflecting um, based on several research projects that I've been conducted for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And they all have to do in a way with kind of um, um, experiences of suffering and so their kind of um, ideas of empathy or kick, kick in, um, so to say, like um, with um, in regard to um, Holocaust education, for example, to HIV research, um, to, I don't know, experiences of violence in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. But um, your questions, like coming to your questions finally was like, um, what about empathy in qualitative research, right? So um, so, so, what's the issue here? Because in, in qualitative, especially interpretive research, um, I mean, authors seem to place such a paramount importance on, on empathy. So empathy is not only key in regard to 
I mean, we, we, we mentioned Obama, um, we can go on with Jeremy Rifkins and the kind of um, empathetic civilization, Stephen Pinker, the better angels of our nature. So all these kind of work that um, we've been mentioning or working with, um, but it's also in regard to, to qualitative research. Um, so there seems to be kind of a proximity, uh, proximity of concepts of qualitative and especially in, um, interpretive research to meanings or different meanings of empathy. In interpretive research, um, we, I mean, it's based on the idea of understanding, right? Like verstehen in, in German, like focusing on subjectivity and lived experiences. And in a way, empathy seems to be, seems to promise kind of to bridge like the fundamental gap between different experiences, subjectivities and, and life worlds, so to say. I mean, there are differences probably in regard to certain traditions and uh, some uh, methods and methodologies seem to be closer than that. Like think about like, I don't know, um, expert interviews, um, their empathy does not seem to play such a, um, such a huge role or uh, discourse analysis, for example. Um, but um, if you think about like biographical research of uh, or psychoanalytically informed social research, um, their kind of, um, of, of, of empathetic um, uh, ideas um, can be can be highlighted. And in, in a way, um, it's I'm just kind of um, going on with a couple of um, of uh, examples, maybe. I mean, yes. if, if you go through like the different st methods or stages of qualitative research, um, we begin with data collection, right? So, for example, in interviews and group discussions and ethnographic approaches, uh, for example, like their empathy um, seems to be seems to play such an important role for building up trust and relationship and kind of promote and sustain rapport um, by creating an atmosphere of, of resonance, um, mutual understanding. So, um, in a way, empathy is here closely connected to kind of emotion work in developing and sustaining report um, within these kind of qualitative uh, relationships. Um, for example, I mean, we, we, I mean, probably most, most of the people in the class or in the room where you are have uh, kind of been to any kind of uh, qualitative um, class in, in one another uh, kind of role as students or kind of teachers. But um, whenever we, we teach kind of, um, of how to to um to to act and react in kind of um interview settings um it's it's always about um kind of um trying to create an atmosphere of this kind of trust and relationship and kind of um trying to have the flow of, of conversation uh, kind of um go on and um with kind of smaller kind of inputs like you know this kind of short and neutral and diffuse responses that like this mm -hmm. yeah ah ah mm. this kind of yeah and understand you not only i understand you but in a way i, I feel i go with you I'm, I'm in resonance with you to tell but also um on the other side this kind of um more more kind of response cries and in, in, um, in, um if people tell you about kind of um sensitive things and kind of emotional things they expect you as a researcher to to react in a way with empathetic um expressions this kind of oh my god oh, oh yeah oh, oh no okay oh, so this kind of um it's so it's not it's not in empathy itself but it's kind of the impression or kind of the expression of empathy um that that i'm talking about here this kind of doing empathy as a way of like um like like um conducting or implementing kind of strategic um empathy um in, in in this regard so um that's that's one one element like in the um in the process of of data collection um but um yeah and i mean i, I could i could give an example from from yeah. of, from one of um the studies that we did just to um, to, to highlight this a little bit, it's um, with a, um, a research project on the experiences of young refugees um, in, uh, in, in Germany. And this was one of the, uh, uh, was kind of narrative biographical interviews. And this interview was conducted with a 20 year old um, young man 
from um, a, from a, a country in uh, in Western Africa, and he talked about his his um, his path to to Germany. It took really kind of seven years, and he was talking about his time in in Libya, where he was like trying to pass the Mediterranean Sea a um, couple of times, and was kind of arrested and arrested and um, and um, sent to prison and kind of tortured um, there as well. Um, and uh, the inter uh, and the interviewer, one one of my colleagues, Aisha, um, she asked him there, um, "Can you? Um, I don't know if it's okay for you. Can you tell a little bit about your time in Libya?" Um, and interesting, he, he he replies, "No, I'll show you. I won't tell you. I will show you." Um, and then he kind of um, um, kind of lifts his, his shirt and shows like the the, the scars um, of of the torture um and it's uh, and the, the reaction of course it's like oh my god oh my god <laughs> what did they do to you kind of this um and it goes on um this kind of um of, of attunement of, of different um reactions and when we say well what, what did they do for, uh, to you and he kind of repeats again saying no i won't really want to go into that and so so on but this um well what i was trying to highlight is this kind of emotional reaction, um, this kind of, oh my God, that kind of um, seems to um, be an important um, kind of um, expression of empathy here. Um, and it's interesting um, to, to kind of look uh, to certain um, situations where, where these kind of um, empathetic expressions fail um, to, um, to manifest. And just, just the last one, I'm skipping the kind of analytic part but um, also empathy of course plays a huge role in the way of how we present our data um there there's a there's an interesting um i mean debate going on how, how to write up qualitative data and um following up a, um an, an important piece by some p and richardson saying well we don't need another re uh, boring research report we don't need this kind of standardized whatever we need kind of real stories we need to have exciting stories so um we have this kind of claim for um not another boring of report but intensely narrated story that allows identifications and kind of another kind of empathetic reactions to bridge the different life worlds um, and call for action so to say and um if you look into the literature you find a couple of books for example by uh, Ronald Pelias, um, kind of a book called The Creative Qualitative Researcher, um, where he writes, I quote, fundamental to the writing process and to creative scholarship is the ability to empathize with others. It, it necessitates entering into space occupied by others and pausing long enough to take account. Um, and goes on later on saying, well, empathy is a prerequisite for good qualitative scholarship. And this is kind of really, really runs through um, kind of the text, the kind of mainstream textbooks, the curricula, the kind of um, empathy is key within qualitative research um, to build up yeah, relationship, to uh, sustain report, to analyze the data, to know where to look at, and to present a story that really um, touches people and that they could relate to. Right. So, so it seems to be so central in this field, uh, so, as you said, a textbook uh, uh, and, and even in, in a way, uh, uh, it is not only the interviewers that expect to be empathetic, interviewees also expect to be treated in an empathetic way. It is well ingrained. It is canonical, let's say. Um, yeah. But then you've mentioned uh, when we briefly spoken that you have experienced some struggles let's say, in these kind of experimental settings uh, with empathy. And I wonder if you could share with us some, some of these uh, sort of struggles or problematics that you've identified in your work um, that are rooted in this expectation, in the centrality uh, or the textbook uh, case of empathy within these experimental mm. schools. Mm. Um, one, one, one issue to start with is that, um, I mean, here the, the the colloquiums about like the ambivalences and the dark sides right like the problematic aspects and um if i mean 
if um, like following this is kind of uh, Paul Bloom's against empathy, yes. we kind of um, have identified uh, several several issues that we've already talked about today, like the spotlight character, for example, and the kind of moral neutrality or flexibility um, of of, uh, of empathy. And in this regard, it's interesting that um, at least in qualitative research, these kind of dark sides seem to be quite productive and useful in a way. This kind of spotlight character that you present one story kind of intensely, kind of um, the, the, the ways of being able to identify with the kind of the, the, the heroes here. But at the same time, and this um, kind of is related to what we've done, for example, in uh, with former ISIS child soldiers in Northern Iraq, it's this kind of um, the, yeah, the, the uh, moral neutrality, the kind of possibility to, to empathize um, kind of not only with the perpetrator um, as well. So it's kind of not only, um, not only um, kind of um, em empathizing with like, like the good guys or the victims or violence, but also with the perpetrators of, um, of, of violence. So it's, mm, um, and that's, that's interesting, but it kind of troubles us as well in, in a way. Um, the, the project that was I was kind of mentioning it um, we were um, the was about the aim was to kind of um, trying to understand better the um, experiences and psychosocial social struggles of uh, children who were um, affiliated with ISIS in northern Iraq between like 2015 and 18 roughly um, like children um, like uh, either Yazidi um, children or Arab Sunni um, boys who were um, often violently abducted um, by ISIS, um, ideologized, militarized, um, sent, sent to war. Um, and um, after kind of being being freed again, living in like prisons or camps, et cetera. Um, and we, we, we try to understand what they've like kind of lived through as kind of an extreme traumatization, traumatizing experience and um, what their psychosocial needs in, in a way um, could be. And, um, and in this regard, it's um, thinking about empathy. If you go into kind of a research encounter with um, someone who, well, as a child soldier, is kind of labeled as child soldier, um, what who do you empathize with? Is it like the victim side of the story? Um, is it the perpetrator side of the story? Is it like can, can you can you distinguish between them? Is it like both? So what 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 happens in in, in this in this regard? And um, there there is a interesting paper by a uh, two um, two psychoanalysts Dutch psychoanalysts um, who write about their work with um, one ISIS child, with one former um, child soldier, not ISIS related. And um, the, the paper is, um, is called Meet Your Murderous Self. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of exactly what kind of, um, what kind of troubled us there as well. This kind of, um, um, that empathy here, this way of trying to kind of bridge the kind of, um, fundamental difference between um, the life worlds here. I mean, it's it's like it needs also kind of to to accept the perpetrator side of the kind of empathetic um, dynamic between uh, between us, so to say. Um, but beyond that, um, I would say um, like this kind of I talked about this um, doing empathy that usually textbooks etc. Say well you need to be empathetic in or kind of at least show empathetic reaction. Um, it's um, in a way it's so strategic um, and it's kind of um, ethically problematic because in a way it um, leads to um, kind of an exploitation of the stories of others, especially when you do research with um, vulnerable or marginalized groups and it's this kind of um, strategic way to show empathy in a way um, just to get to the kind of accord to the story or whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's a way of violence, right? I mean, um, 
there there is um in in, in quality one kind of tradition a school of uh qualitative of interpretive research is this um is biographically oriented research and um there's the idea in, in German, it's it's called Erzählzwang, like the um, force to narrate, like the idea if you just ask a, a good question that generates a kind of um, a, a, a narration, people um, just go on and go on and kind of have to tell the story as coherent as possible, as kind of um, complete as possible. And if you just show minimal reactions in, you know, is these kind of small empathetic ways, and um, so in 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 the concept of Erzählzwang, the force to narrate this kind of violent um, aspect uh, of the strategic of strategically doing empathy seems to be um, seems to be um, kind of um, in, inscribed, uh, so to say. Um, and interestingly, um, and, and then please just interrupt me because I mean I could go on forever, I guess, but. Um, Interestingly, um, our research partners often um, kind of either realize, understand, feel this kind of being exploited in this kind of strategic way of, you know, um, because of course, I mean, the interview, it's an artificial kind of setting that you create, that it's kind of a joint interaction, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in a way, you, you try to, try to um kind to to do as if it's kind of a normal way to just um tell the story kind of the idea the romantic idea of an authentic self that kind of um, unfolds in front of you etc but um the exploitation here i mean the, the the feeling of well there's something going on kind of not the 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 real real empathy thing but it's a strategic um it's often is felt and um kind of perform i mean kind of um reacted in acts of resistance um sometimes um there there's an interesting paper by abel and others who write about like trying similarity and doing difference in a way that um that these kind of false i mean the, the kind of the feeling of false empathy is kind of um blocked by the other in, in kind of interesting ways. Um, I had an interview um, a couple of years ago with my second PhD project on um, sexual, um, on, on psychosocial dynamics of sexual risk behavior in the context of HIV and AIDS. And I interviewed um, gay and bisexual men who got um, kind of a recent HIV diagnosis. Um, and um, I, there was one, one kind of older man um, that I that I interviewed from a very different kind of life world in, in regard not only to generation and age but also to kind of the um, kind of the milieu and, and others um, and so the story was very different the life world was different the the story that he presented was different and nevertheless in the interview I tried to kind of connect to him um, kind of all the time and but whenever I, I try to kind of show this kind of empathetic reaction to say, well, I feel with you, I totally understand, I totally feel what 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 you what you're just telling in terms of um discrimination, of stigmatization, of being othered. Um he kind of just distanced himself from saying, well, no, no, this is this is definitely not what you what 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 you experienced in a kind of polite way, so to say. Uh, we were talking about kind of films that um that could be touching so to say and um i was referring to one and he just said well no it did not even kind of get close to um to 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 uh. so um and this is interesting in these moments when when you look at the material that you say well um usually you would expect here kind of an empathetic reaction or kind of and this kind of just fails and just yes. to see what, what happens here um Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean you, you're you're drawing here um, well two two instances of failure, huh? and the first one that you've mentioned is this kind of empathy. I would say maybe empathy of solicitation, uh, empathy of interrogation, the solicitation of truth uh, mm -hmm. out of the subject. You know, uh, when uh, someone is uh, captured and the uh, 
intelligence uh, unit wants to get the information out of him, they sometimes use empathy to do that. They don't always uh, torture the person and there are ways to do it. it as you said, you call it, you called it an exploitation, some sort of, of problematic you identified there. And then you, we, uh, on the other side, we might say, oh, but there is an empathy of understanding, right? I want to understand you. And that might be a, a, a sort of a realm that remains unproblematized. But then you're saying, well, also when I try to understand someone, uh, I, I sometimes get into trouble, right? As you gave the example right now with this, with this man in the movie. And I'll just, I'll just mention something um, before we proceed to, to my next question to you. That empathy, I started being interested in empathy even before working on it in the domain of autism through my uh, uh, psychoanalytic formation. And uh, in the Lacanian orientation, there's a certain a dictum uh, that we, we say against understanding. The analyst is not there to understand. On the contrary, the analyst must resist any attempt to understand uh, the subject uh, right there. And in this sense, there it is, it is a dictum that goes against empathy, against the empathy of understanding. Of course, you feel things for the patients or not, that's your own business. But in the an analysis, there is no attempt to understand. Um, and here you gave us a very interesting example uh, of an attempt to use empathy as a possibility uh, to understand, but in fact, when doing so, missing out on something very crucial in the testimony of this subject that you are investigating. So in another way, what you are saying is that there is something to be gained, uh, not through understanding, but actually through gaps of understanding, moments of misunderstanding, uh, moments of distance. And I wonder if, if you could develop this a little bit uh, in terms of what, what would you say are the productive aspects in this kind of interpretive, qualitative research uh, that could be based on actually non-empathetic moments? So moments where empathy fails. How can we actually make something of that uh, within the research? Yeah, I mean, um, two, two answers. The first is like, um, I would kind of... Uh, stress what you've just said in regard to, to Lacan, I mean, from a kind of epistemological point of view, this kind of um, idea to use empathy in quantitative interpretive research as a way of kind of, of understanding it kind of um, stresses the idea of, of sameness, of possibility yes. to understand. It's um, even kind of like colonizing <laughs> like the other from one's own um, po point of view. And of course, this is highly problematic, like not only epistemologically, but also ethically. It's kind of, it's, it's another form of, 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 of symbolic violence, um, so to say. Um, and so the question um, you, you pose is like, how, how can we do this kind of differently in, in a way? And I think um, there are, the different answers to, to these question to this question. Um, one of course is like, um, and now I'm speaking from a kind of ethno-psychoanalytic um, point of view to um, have if you have the material at hand and then um, look for these kind of of irritations in, in the material where these kind of um, disturbances within the communication and especially in regard um, not only to the kind of cognitive side of it but on this kind of effective side occurs. And um, this goes back um, in a way, the, the idea of like a um, psycho, um, ethno-psychoanalytic um, approach to, to um, qualitative, uh, qualitative um, research goes back to um, Georges de Barreau, um, like a French, um, French scientist who wrote the uh, um, interesting book, Anxiety to Method um, in 1967, um, I guess. Um, kind of claiming that the most kind of valid data that, that we have um, is not like the kind of objectified manif uh, data on the manifest level of whatever the observation or the interview, but um, the, the, the subjectivity of the research and the way um, that the, the research that we do kind of affects ourselves um, emotionally, et cetera, bodily. Um, and so the idea is kind of, um, applying a um, counter transference analysis of kind of um, making this a part of the research process to 
um, understand like the, I mean, following the irritations in the material and in the research process to understand what's 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 going on um, here. And um, in, in this regard, as, as, I mean, I've just only briefly um, touched the story with the um, interview partner in the HIV project, the older but Klaus, I mean, um, written about that um, um, kind of extensively. Um, it was interesting there. Um, when, I mean, I, I did the interview, interestingly, and um, afterwards I just got ill. <laughs> it was like um, um, the kind of, I, I don't know, it was like for two weeks, it was like um, kind of too much. And I think this also has to do with, um, with empathy, with the kind of overkill or not, whatever. I mean, it, it it certainly has an um, impact here. Um, however, and I, I did not touch the material for I think one year because something there was something toxic, so to say, in this. And when, when I when I finally got to the material and read, read through it, it was like saying, "Well, oh my God, um, so many kind of failures, um, so to say, in regard to what the textbook would say, how I should have reacted here, how." Um, but Mm. Um, and following this was kind of the kind of irritations and disturbances and kind of gaps in the understanding. So kind of sharp misunderstandings in the field were kind of a path forward to see, well, what's going on here? So what it's it's not kind of a um, kind of systematic failure, but kind of a situational one um, that allows us to understand um, something from the um, of the phenomenon that um, that we study. And in this regard, it was about um, the experiences um, of HIV positive men within certain social um, environments. Because my interview partner told me about um, his uneasiness within the gay scene as, I mean, as being othered in regard to generation, or the generation, but also in regard to this um, kind of, yeah, milieu, et cetera, socioeconomic status, blah, blah. Um, and in a way, I was the one in the interview who did exactly this, kind of othering him in this interview um, by kind of not being able here to, to empathize with him, not being able to. So, um, so in this regard, I would say um, we could kind of um, follow irritations, follow the kind of effective irritations in the material in order to um, get a better understanding of um, the phenomenon. Phenomenon, but and on the other side, um, it's like um, like thinking about the the presentation of the material. It's like um, thinking about ways to present our material that do not kind of seduce readers um, to kind of follow the identification and empathetic way of of reading, but um, Kind of playing a little bit with the with moments of creating empathy, creating kind of a sense of, of proximity, of sameness, of kind of, um, but then kind of disrupting this um, kind of um, producing moments of, of of alienation and kind of a fr fragmented way of um, of, of presenting um, our our stories. There, um, there is a. There's a wonderful book also um, in um, in regard to HIV by by Patty Leather. Um, she wrote in the kind of I think at the end of the 80s or beginning of the 90s on HIV positive women in the United States and using this um, fragmented way of, um, of, of of writing stories of um, of integrating statistics, then presenting some some memos and reflections. Um, then transcripts, um, excerpts, um, and kind of really different voices and multi-perspectivities um, that, that kick in. And so kind of not allowing an easy way of, of digesting the stories, but um, in a way um, feeling to, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the question here is, and you see it, I'm still, Kind of thinking, and I don't have an answer to that. Is um, how do we? Is there something like in reflexive um, empathy that we could use 
in qualitative research. So it's not this kind of naive re, um, empathy, not this kind of strategic one. Um, but without empathy and without this kind of empathetic reactions and dynamics within, um, probably it's, it's not going to happen because we need to build up trust. We need to build up the report. But um, how can we do this ethically? How can we do this reflexively? And um, what does that mean for like providing um, a an, an narrative about that? And um, I don't know, um, I, I was thinking about also, and I'm kind of jumping a little bit around with the issues. Um, if, if we think about the um, of interviews as probably the most, um, most important method of gathering qualitative data, um, it's to, to think about different formats of, of interview, kind of series maybe of, of interviews with the same person um, to be able to reflect on what has happened in the first one, maybe in the second one, in creating kind of um, common third spaces to jointly reflect about what's going on um, also in regard to um, the, the empathetic moments that do occur um, that, um, or not uh, sometimes. See, well, I'm, I'm always a bit puzzled as to the distinction or, or let's say why is empathy or why is, I mean, let's say in, in the clinical setting, I'll return to that, uh, the transference is very important. As you said, something that opens up the space where work can be achieved. And I, I wonder if in, the, in, the, in these uh, interpretive and qualitative research uh, methods, in fact, we're talking about transference and not about empathy in this term. As a way of... of, of, of Kind of of enab enabling speech, uh, free association. Well, well yeah, I, I'm, I was, I was, as I said uh, before, um, in regard like to, for example, interviews and data gathering, um, I wouldn't, I would call it kind of expressions of empathy, like this kind of strategic empathy that yes. the client, that for example, with the conversational analysis, you could kind of check in the material how this is kind of produced. Um, so, and I would say, um, like in with regard to psychoanalytic concepts, um, it's more important in in in, in regard to um, like the analysis of of the material. Um, I see. Okay, um, I have a, I have some questions of my own, particularly about uh, a particular particular concept, but. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, open this up for questions from the audience, and uh, for our Zoom participants, um, I promise to uh, give you preference this time. So, if there are any questions from the Zoom crowd, please raise your hand because this is the only way we'll see that you want to to ask a question at this point. Um, but also, I'm opening it up here uh, for. Yeah, um, take the spotlight out. Mm -hmm. Sure. You're okay. Yeah. Drink tea, other people. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so let me let me begin. Oh. Is this from now? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think that was in relation to the previous talk. Yes. It was. Sorry. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's it's in relation to the previous talk. So, Phil, um, we've discussed um, this notion called empathetic unsettlement, right? I, and and you've you've really I, I found it fascinating, and especially your perspective on it. And you started talking about philosophers and philosophy in, in these concepts. So for me, it was it was excellent. I wonder if if you'd like to tell us a little bit about that, um, and sort of what, what's your point, viewpoint on it? Yeah, um, I mean the the idea of of empathetic and settlement, or kind of the, um, it refers to how it was framed by Dominic Placabra, like a psychoanalytically uh, working um, historian, working in the Holocaust, um, etc. And he talks about um, trauma here. And um, 
and kind of in the face of trauma, he says we need to remain in in this kind of stage of empathetic unsettlement. So um, as a way of you know being able to to relate to the suffering of the others, but still this kind of um, being being troubled and not kind of digesting it, not kind of colonizing it, not kind of. So it's it still um, keeps the idea of a um, gap of understanding um, here. And I came across this uh, the um, phrase of the empathetic and settlement in, um, in in my work um, in, in traumatized concepts. But I thought it's um, also I mean we, we could kind of transfer it to the way um, of, of presenting um, the the qualitative um, work um, that we do. In a way, it's I mean in, in doing it. Um, uh, in, in, in terms of interpretation, et cetera. So it's um, the, the aim then is not to pretend to kind of know and to um, provide our knowledge to the others as kind of an authoritarian way of, you know, this kind of here's the conference and I give a presentation and I give my, 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 my findings here as kind of results. But um, it's the idea of um, the, the kind of empathetic settlement is kind of, trying to think about ways to, to write up data, um, write up stories that, as I said before, um, kind of keep the balance of, 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 of the need for identification and kind of empathetic um, relationship to the stories, but, but kind of um, stressing also the um, ability of not knowing um, so to say, I mean, this kind of, um, of, 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 um, yeah, to, to, to resist, like, to resist the, the, the claim of, um, presenting in, in a kind of authoritarian voice, but still kind of, um, keeping this kind of, I mean, as I said before, when, when you think about empathy as um, a promise of, of, of fantasy, of, of sameness, um, but knowledge is also kind of, I mean, it, it's, it's, about, it's about kind of respecting difference, um, here to say. So how can we, in a way, um, yeah, how can we produce this kind of, um, of, of difference as a way of not knowing um, here um, in, in, in our reports. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't kind of, it's still in a thinking process here, um, but um, yeah, sorry. But that's, we're here to, that's what we're here to do, Phil. To yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, um, it's, it's the, one of the troubling things for me is like, and that was like really kind of an, I wouldn't say shock, but I mean, thinking um, in the preparation of this um, of this um, of, of this colloquium, it's kind of I'm, I'm very much in favor of this kind of creative and innovative and participatory whatever approaches within um, qualitative um, research. For example, the uh, like like author ethnography, the way of like writing about one story but not as kind of an but but as a means of analyzing like um, social and, and cultural phenomenon that we are part of also in, within our experience and our lived experience, not this kind of individualized way, but kind of a way to understand what kind of how society has been inscribed into us. So, um, and autoethnography um, kind of highly um, emphasize, um, highly stresses the, the importance of, of empathy here. So it's kind of, Pro providing narratives that you know that that kind of really go deep that you are able to 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 resonate with that it's it's on this effective level of um of, of creating empathy through writing here um but if, if if you take the idea seriously that it's also kind of an exploitation that it kind of is something that um that um just promises and kind of an understanding and knowledge but also uh, mm, disregards the, the the fundamental ones there then then we can't go on doing this in this way so um how then could we 
kind of um, keep on this innovative writing. And I'm, I'm still with the idea of the fragment or the fragmented writing, possibly um, in regard to Walter, ben Walter Benjamin and others, probably. Um, but I think it's a challenge for, um, for, for qualitative researchers here to present the data um, in this way, not again reproducing um, boring reports where empathy does not play a role at all and not kind of playing around with the kind of um, empathetic overkill um, in very, very intensely narrated um, stories. I like that empathetic overkill. That's a very nice way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for your contribution. I uh, wrote my dissertation about host families for unaccompanied minors. And I also did some methodological consideration on this topic. And um, yeah, I really see the paradox on somehow that in the moment, for example, this unaccompanied minor refugees, especially, I try to show empathy a lot, like to get the perspective. And then later I made my yeah, my analysis, and then I realized now other perspectives come. And, and then I felt a little bit like I do a betrayal on the perspectives of the persons, also of the host parents and the host family settings. They are doing good for the minors. They are they are playing also a lot like we are good persons. And then I had perspective, okay, they are not only good, they are also doing moralizations and and that's having this in this in mind that they also might read my dissertation really yes let me struggle a lot with what can I write do I yeah do they become angry with me later maybe if they read what I wrote about them and also that in the moment in the like in the bonding moment when I was in the field like I, I of course showed empathy also Sometimes when host parents said something like, uh, it's funny, the unaccompanied minor learned German or something that could be also a little bit like read as racist. Mm. And you have to show some affection somehow to keep the conversation going on. And later, yeah, you realize, oh, I was maybe also a little biased by myself in the situation. You reflect on this. Yeah, but having this in mind, you writing about it later can also make struggles. <laughs> like I really struggled a lot when I wrote also my methodological considerations later on. And I think I, I found a solution in all these reflections, but it's still something that feels still open and I'm a little bit afraid of publishing my <laughs> uh, dissertation later of, um, with all these um, open questions and all my yeah, empathy on the one hand and not empathy on the other hand. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. this qualitative research. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing the experience. I I, I think I know very well. <laughs> I'm, I'm very empathetic now for the story that you provided. I know very well what you're talking um, about, and I think it's um, the one of the one of the um, really. Um, Remarkable things is that um, the, the more kind of critical, the more participatory, like um, we we um, kind of think of our research um, and kind of linking our research to certain kind of um, theor theoretical um, argumentations and schools and kind of doing research in regard to vulnerable groups, marginalized groups. The idea that um, research is a means for for social change, etc. This kind of um, emancipatory um, drive within um, kind of research. The more we 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 relate to that, um, the more problematic the idea of empathy gets, right? Um, as as you said, it, it's not about you know if if you do another expert interview, kind of just pretending to to want to know about uh, kind of certain knowledge acquiring. Um, information, so that that's that's okay. We we don't have any problem with that, right? Um, I mean, we do, but we pretend not to. So, and we can write another research report, another boring blah blah. Doesn't matter at all. But um, the lives of people that that matter to us, um, because the kind of life, 
the, the groups that we do research is are um, need to need to be kind of supported by our research because they are marginal because they etc. Um, then empathy kind of the, the ambivalences of, of the of empathy within the research um, kind of uh, manifests on, on, on very uh, different levels and the idea of how can I um, do justice to that um, suddenly appears until the end of the as you said the the publication and uh, I'm very curious uh, then to find out how you will solve the problem um, with that please uh yeah so thank you uh for for sharing your thoughts um it's too bad that you couldn't be here with us because i would have liked to discuss other things with you as well um but uh, maybe you don't um i think my utmost academic challenge is to stress a few things again and again so i will stress um the idea of the self-concept again that I raised uh, this morning. Um, when we think of social interactions, and some of them may be social interactions within an academic or scientific context, like collecting data by interviewing someone else. If we think of these acts, like hostile acts, or if we use concepts like colonizing the other, or doing harm to the other, and so on. Isn't that more plausible if you think of independent selves interacting with each other? Because then suddenly it's more plausible that you actually colonize the other. But if you understand the self as a system which is constituted by at least two persons and which they share, which means they share a common self that they construe through their interactions, which we call an interdependent self, right? Isn't is then colonizing or intruding or doing harm an understanding that does not really describe what's going on? Because actually, if you have two individuals interacting, two separate systems, okay, then there is a riddle, of course, because you need a bridge in order to overcome the gap. But if there is no gap, because the relationship is all what there, what there is, okay, then many of the problems that you addressed just disappear. So, isn't a, a large bundle of the problems that you um, 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 addressed very dependent on how we use our understandings of selves and are they culturally shaped themselves? Absolutely. Um, I, I would. I mean, I'm. I'm not sure if I could follow you in, in every nuance of your argumentation, but um, definitely. So, what I was trying to um, to, to elaborate on is um, indeed a certain way of, um, I mean, my, my colleague um, in, in Toronto, um, um, Siung, she, she calls it a kind of Anglo-American um, kind of paradigm uh, probably of, of doing qualitative research um, I'm here. And it, what I was trying to elaborate is exactly like from, from this Anglo-American or Western or um, however you call it, point of view, how research is conceptualized. And indeed, if you conceptualize in this way, and it's these kind of certain um, uh, concepts that, that, you, um, that you talked about, then we get into um, the, these troubles, um, definitely. The question is, and maybe you, could, um, maybe you could share your thoughts here as well, is how, how, how could we conceptualize um, qualitative interpretive whatever research um differently then um what we try what we tried for example um is like thinking about the isis child soldiers is that we um we we didn't do much interviews there because again we also kind of realized that 
doing in I mean usually doing interviews is seen as a very kind of sensitive way kind of subject oriented etc cetera, etc cetera. but doing interviews with um with these um militarized young men um was was kind of I mean we realized it very 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 soon that um this was another kind of um uh of, of kind of felt violently because um it, it reminded them of um interrogation techniques um by, by ISIS and by the security forces that um they were caught uh, by after their the liberation so kind of um so interviews didn't really um were not kind of the um solution and what we came up with um was the uh, a method of collaborative uh, story writing so we we created um groups of 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 um of five to uh, to three to five um boys um in the different environments of, of camp of the um idp camps and uh, of um juvenile um prisons um there and asked them to kind of develop a story together um a joint story of a fictional character of a militarized um boy i mean um and so it's it was this kind of as if uh, mode that they were in our that at least was our our, our aim um to be able to write about their story to write their story to talk about or to work through their um experience um in a way or to present their story as a kind of um fictional joint as if um mode story um and this this could i mean maybe this is one um still within a kind of a western paradigm but um kind of a way of um doing qualitative research differently there so we did not get kind of a single story of xyz um but kind of a kind of a complex intertwined um story of um of a, of a possible um lived experience there um but i was also kind of reminded when when you talked about a uh, different other um um indigenous uh, methodologies that um I, I um i came across and that i um at least with colleagues work with in, in canada and, and australia um that try to um not to to use the kind of uh, independent selves as a kind of conceptual basis of their of their methodologies but um what what other or may, may i ask do you have any any ideas of um how your ideas would kind of guide um or inform the conceptualization of qualitative methodologies and methods differently Well, first of all, um, to take the example, um, how you manage to deal with the um, child soldiers and to make them um, come up with a fictional picture which entails aspects of all the five of those child soldiers, is actually asking them to construe an interdependent self in some way, right? by supposing that they will be able to do that actually you are already treating them as interdependent selves and not as dependent selves so this, this is the point that i want to make in our scientific approach we have two choices we can just be the members of our academic culture which is just a small part of our broader social culture and we can use what that has to offer in order to our to do our academic research. And then we do it with the concepts that we know. So for example, with the concept of the independent self. So what I am proposing, why not think of other concepts of selves and make them slowly but progressively the dominating understanding of selves because they might be more adequate. And is it naive what I'm proposing? Some might say, yes, that's naive because the independent self idea is a Western idea. And since Western ideas are the dominating ideas all over the world, the independent idea will be, right? But as we know, that happened by being exported to other regions of the world. At the same time, we are witnessing that the West is not 
at all interested in introducing other concepts, concepts into the Western discussion. So before we start thinking about how to do adequate qualitative research, we should be really open. And openness is, as you know, one of the key pillars of qualitative research. So show and prove how qualitative we are, we really are, right? Which means open up to other concepts and test them in qualitative research, which yeah. would result in, in changing the perspective. And that seems to be the only way to bring new ideas into social science. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your ideas. I mean, I, I'm really, I really like that uh, idea. I'm, 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 I wouldn't say it's, it's naive, but it's kind of, I think, very, very challenging, of course. I mean, I mean, puts a lot of um, trust in in what we do as as as, as a researchers, right? To um, start a process of also kind of um, changing um, certain um, understandings of self in relation to environment. Um, and I was just thinking, I mean, if, if you, I mean, two to, to aspects. Um, one is like if you do research in with with people who kind of incorporate, of course, kind of this kind of independent self idea, um, you, you need to take that into account, right, in your research. You can't just pretend that it's not there and can't come up with something different. So it's, we need to find subversive ways of changing that slowly. And um, um, I would be, um, I would be glad to to be part of that uh, endeavor, so to say. But the second, um, this comes back to our empathy um, uh, topic is so, and this is also kind of a question, maybe um, we don't find an answer to that, but um, if we have this kind of, what, what I was trying to, to elaborate on as a Western way of doing quantitative research and then the independent one, and then empathy is a problem and the more, Kind of uh, kind of critical you get, and the more mm, the more it gets problematic, which is kind of um, the paradox, no dilemma. Let's let's put it this way. And you say, well, we could do this differently. Um, this what 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 where what what kind of do, do do we need the concept of empathy then, or is it something that doesn't play a role anymore in the conceptualization that you? Um, that you propose? I mean, is there kind of an collective, empathetic dynamic then, or is it just something that we don't need to take into account anymore? And I'm not sure about that, but I uh, would be glad to get into the discussion next time physically um, in Berlin and Bochum, of course. Yes, please. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Bill, uh, for your talk. And just to follow up on the uh, these questions of different uh, methodologies, uh, and you mentioned uh, indigenous methodologies as well from Canada and Australia. Uh, certainly in my home city in Vancouver, a lot of work, there's an area of the city, uh, the so-called Skid Row or the downtown east side, which is called the most researched area in the country. Uh, it's the poorest area and the most researched. And in the past uh, decade or so, uh, um, resident groups have uh, sort of devised this uh, manifesto called Research 101 uh, with the motto of nothing about us, without us. Um, and this argument that social science research in particular, uh, when dealing with uh, intractable seeming as social problems around addiction, uh, opioid overdose, uh, homelessness, and so on, uh, needs to be more bottom up needs to be more directed by uh, community members. And so I wonder in terms of your working, on the one hand, you're working with these different groups, whether it's, and I, I'm not sure exactly which groups you've worked with, but child soldiers or HIV uh, involved uh, marginalized populations and so on. Uh, what role, because there are problems as well with that sort of user-based, uh, uh, I've worked in this community for a long time and I don't want to be romantic and so on. But what role does that kind of bottom up uh, politics and methodology, what, what, what role does empathy or the critique of empathy play in that, in, that re, in that new idea of a new relationship between the researcher and the researched populations? Uh, 
Um, this is a good question. I think um, it's. I mean, you. Um, I'm. 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 I'm not an expert, of course, uh, in this particular context, but it is um, kind of community-based participatory yeah. action research that you're talking about, right? Yeah. And um, in this sense, where kind of the, the roles of the research or the research gets a little bit, I mean, quite diffused and it's um, it's a power sensitive way um, where you, where, where those who we used to describe as the objects of our research get our kind of research partners in, in this regard. Um, I think you can, I mean, I think I don't, right now I would say, well, empathy might not play such a huge role as in different other contexts that I've described before, this kind of textbook thing where you, this kind of strategic, naive, whatever. Um, here it's in a way, um, at least in the relationship of the research and the researched, um, I think it's, it doesn't play such a big role anymore. So kind of getting rid of a bit of the um, of the uh, ambivalences here, I think. And um, I'm, I like to, in a way, think, and this is not a solution or whatever, but I mean, Paul Bloom in his book Against Empathy, he makes an argument, say, well, um, beyond empathy, we need to, I mean, to, to stress um, ideas of, of, of concern, so to say, kind of different way of not, not this kind of um, just being empathetic with all this kind of dark sides, but kind of showing um, kind of concern and kind of a passionate thing. And um, so kind of the relationship gets differently based and so not so much on empathy probably. Um, I'm not sure if that's an answer right now. Um, what I well, what I was also thinking while you were you was you were um, talking is like again the the way that we and the we now in this kind of community based participatory action research. If you look at ways how the um, how the uh, findings are presented, of course, there's a kind of very different ways and strategies, but one is because it's action, action research is about like how to, to, to promote social change. And um, there again comes the idea that um, if you present it in a way that people um, kind of I can identify with and kind of empathize with um, like the, the, the stories of a certain group of a certain neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, with all the metaphors that uh, we were presented in the first talk from kind of the, the, the spatial and, and visual forms, um, then they get more into the idea of really changing something as part of a kind of political action. Um, so um, well, what I would assume, and I think this could be interesting for, for kind of a brief for a research um, project is to see whether the, whether empathy um, is, is, is highlighted more in participatory action research um, in ways of, um, of um, kind of presenting the, uh, the outcomes or the kind of dynamics or whatever is, is presented here to the, to the public. But that's um, just an assumption, I would say. Great, thank you. Can I add up? Yes. Uh, no, uh, let me not take forward the questions that have been raised already. I'm just sharing by way of self doubt another. Uh, you know, uh, is it also because we formulate the question beforehand? Uh, we do it maybe at the university, say, for example, or in our head. Um, and then we try to find the field. So, uh, and we have a classroom field divide as if the classroom is not a field and the field is outside somewhere else. Uh, is it also because 
we, we formulate the question beforehand and then find the participant or subject or something like that. And this has been the history actually. Uh, and part of it looks natural, normal to us also. Um, is it also because, and this connects to the question that came up regarding the indigenous context, etc. Is it also because the question doesn't come from either the participant or the teacher? The question is not from coming from that side, actually. And the kind of care we had in the earlier session regarding autism and non-autistic, um, you know, we are being very, very careful over there. I don't know, I, I say this with self-doubt and much uncertainty, but the researched and the researcher division is not uh, adequately as if opened up or shaken uh, the way we were, you know, very careful in the previous session regarding autistic and non-autistic, very careful. That's just by way of a doubt I'm sharing. I think one, uh, one is the question Pradeep raised and Clint also took it forward that where is the other over here? But the other problem perhaps is that the question is formulated. And the kind of difficulties you raised just now that how to write, whether write, uh, am I writing on them? Uh, because how will research become with and not on? Is a, is a question that we in the social sciences perhaps need to ask. Time perhaps to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, can uh, continue in many different ways, but the last one is like this kind of how to write with, but not on it, because we're in the academia and like at the end of the day, it's about publish and perish for many of us at least. So at the end of the day, it's then writing about, and not with, because, um, and, but I mean, there, there, there's one, one maybe interesting paper that I really would, would like to, to, um, to point to um, from uh, the Australian context with, um, it's, I, I, need, I need to check that and uh, could send it to you, Leon, so to, to distribute that. Um, yes. It's, for, for, to my knowledge, it was like the first paper um and maybe it's the only one i don't know it's from kind of within the um social geography um field and where the the landscape itself um was one of the authors of the paper so um the the the, the um the researchers started and they kind of reflect upon that with a kind of a idea of doing research on yeah on the land on the people there um and realized that it's like recognizing and taking into account the indigenous um, ontology and methodology and epistemology there um, would mean not to do it on but with. So to take the land, the landscape, like the, the very soil as kind of an actor um, of, 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 of research, which is kind of a challenging um, and troubling um, idea for many researchers i think so but consequently at the end of the day with the publication it was not only the researcher and um, part of the community as um as, as co-researchers here but also the uh, baklava county as the land as an author um I'm, I'm not sure if that's kind of an answer to that um in a way um how, how to do this but it's kind of showing different ways of um Reconceptualizing um, qualitative uh, methods in this regard. Well, I think it's it's a good uh, place to stop. <laughs> um, right on time. It feel this is a great idea. If uh, I will, I will collect papers from the speakers that they think you might benefit from. And whoever here or in the Zoom uh, audience wants to receive this paper bundle, I will just send it. So just send an email to the KKC email and you'll receive the, the paper bundle. And I'd love to get uh, get that paper from you, Phil, and also something that you have written yourself that would be good for the audience. So thanks for this spontaneous suggestion. Thank you. And thanks.
Thanks for joining us on Zoom. Uh, now we will all take a short rest, uh, 10 minutes, uh, refresh yourselves. And Razak, are you there? You're next. Uh, Razak will be.